Welcome back to the Free Mind Podcast, where we explore topics in Western history, politics, philosophy, literature, and current events with a laser focus on seeking the truth and an adventurous disregard for ideological and academic fashions. I'm Matt Burgess, Assistant Professor of Environmental Studies and Faculty Fellow of the Benson Center for the Study of Western Civilization at the University of Colorado Boulder. My guest today is Diego Reynero. Diego Reynero is MindCore Postdoctoral Research Fellow in the Annenberg School of Communication at the University of Pennsylvania. He studies how people's moral and political views change through conversations and social networks. He has also done research that challenges the idea that the predominantly liberal political views of academics affect the quality of research and the range of results published in his field of social psychology. Jumping off of this research, we discuss to what extent academia actually has a liberal bias, and in what ways claims of liberal bias may be overstated. Diego Renero, welcome to the Free Mind Podcast. Hey, it's great to be here. Yeah, I really appreciate you coming on. I've been looking for a while to do an episode with somebody who will provide evidence-based arguments that challenge or at least complicate one of the, what you might call, axiomatic assumptions of the Benson Center. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, m- maybe even an assumption so axiomatic as to be central to the Benson Center's origin story. And that assumption is that academia is a left monoculture, especially at the faculty level, maybe especially at the grad student administrator level, and that because it's a left monoculture, that biases the scholarship and teaching in some way. And so I, I reached out to you because we have a, a mutual acquaintance, or probably more than an acquaintance for you, uh, named Jay Van Babel, and, and, and you and he uh, have done some really interesting work that I think does try to challenge or complicate this narrative. And And, and, and what's particularly interesting is that I believe one of your papers was written in direct response to a paper authored by Corey Clark, who was a guest in this podcast a few episodes ago talking about this topic. So it seems like a nice full circle. You know, I'm all about uh, what Heterodox Academy calls the HXA way, steel manning, viewpoint diversity, constructive disagreement. Um, And so I guess as a start, can you just tell me about, you know, what your interest in this topic and, you know, for our audience who are not academics and probably haven't read your study, um, what did you look at and what did you find and what did you think it means? Yeah, great. This is, this is a great topic. Um, yeah, so I, my interest in this, I think, stemmed from a couple of different places. Um, when I started working on this, there was a huge replication crisis blow up in, our, in psych, the field of psychology. And just you know, for the lay audience, science. can you just explain what you mean by replication? What, yeah, exactly. And non-replication? Yeah. So, yeah, totally. So when scientists, you know, do their work and they do a study, they publish it. And then the question is like, is that legitimate? Is that real? And can another group of scientists and in, in an independent group of scientists go in and try and do that same study a second time? And can they find the same results? And if so, uh, it seems like that work might replicate, right? If you can, you can do it again a second time. Um, and if not, then, then that work might not replicate. And then it becomes a complicated question of like, did the first study that found some cool result, uh, was that the truth or is the study that tried to do it again, that couldn't do it again, uh, is that the truth? So it gets kind of, um, into those muddy waters, but I, I got kind of drawn into this thinking about this through the lens of like, how do we do our science? Uh, what's good science? And you know, what are potential flaws in the way that scientists do their work? And um, so kind of stemming from that uh, whole point in, in time, we started to think about, um, yeah, why is it that psychologists or, you know, social psychologists, which is, which is my, where my PhD is from, um, why is it that we're having these issues of replication come up? You know, why is it that our science seems sometimes robust and other times less so? So we had, you know, and there's, it's a, we can have a whole other podcast about that. But the um, one of the claims that was coming up around the same time was around this kind of liberal bias in, in, in academia, but, you know, more targeted, I think, at the social sciences, you know, like psychology, sociology, economics, those kinds of things. Um, Not less and, economics, actually. 
or sorry, in terms of the demographics, less economics. Uh, yes, yeah, uh, yeah, the, yeah. The faculty on average lean left in all fields, but uh, econ and math and engineering are actually some of the closest to parity. Only you know three to four to one, as opposed to like ten or fifty right. or hundred to one. Right, exactly. If you compare like history versus yeah. like you know business or econ or finance or something. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so we were thinking about this uh, question and noticing that um, at the time there was um, uh, a paper that had come out um, by uh, John Haidt and Jarrett Crawford and uh, Duarte, Jose Duarte sure, and some yeah, others. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, arguing that, that essentially psychology was politically biased and this, this actually, even though it was sort of focused on psychology and I think social psychology in particular, it, it garnered a lot of attention on in the kind of the academic water cooler space, you know, Twitter and, and like sure. lots of people are talking about it. And so uh, we were thinking about the claims that were made in this and we started thinking, you know, like, you know, they, they spell out some pretty helpful arguments there. They present some nice descriptive data of how um, psychology has become more left-leaning over time and how the there's many more psychology, uh, liberal leaning psychologists than there are conservative leaning psychologists and how that ratio has only gotten kind of more egregious over in the past few decades. And so we started thinking about like, you know, well, what does this mean? And, and can we take the argument that they're making and try and get some actual data to test it? Um, and I think one part of the argument that they were making, um, was again, that sort of the, the fact that you have this like homogeneity, like just a, a field full of, of liberal leaning psychologists is bad and bad for a few different reasons. One being that it kind of undercuts the robustness of the research being done. And they provide like a few different examples, like, like sort of um, anecdotal ex- examples of, of how you might ask a survey in a leading way, or you might, you know, name a, a finding a certain way that, and so they, and they kind of, they go through a couple of different examples, but, we wanted to look at whether the kind of political leanings of research was actually implicated in how robust and replicable that research was. So what we did was we, um, we collected about 200 papers in psychology that had replication attempts available, meaning, you know, we had 200 papers where some team of scientists had done some original research. And in addition, uh, another group of people had tried to do the same, you know, do that same study a second time and see if the results held up. So we had this kind of nice um, data set available. So we kind of pulled that all together, and then we had a group of uh, people rate whether the abstract title and abstract of the work was liberal leaning or conservative leaning or sort of moderate in nature. And we had our, our the folks doing this rating come from across the political spectrum. So we, we got you know some liberals to do some ratings, we got conservatives to do ratings, moderates, so forth. And um and what we were curious was is you know does the political slant of the research, the sort of the findings that are coming out, is that related to whether or not this work is really robust and whether it replicates? And just to kind of like make really explicit, I think what we were what wh- why why you might expect that. Um, is to say that, like, if, you know, if you, let's say you publish a paper and it has a claim and, and the finding of it is something that you could see really supporting, like, a liberal narrative, right? Um, that um, if you find that result and you submit it to a journal to get published and the, the journal sends it out for peer review, meaning they send it out and a few other expert scientists in the field look, look it over and uh, give it some feedback and review and see if it's up to snuff or not to get published, that if you have a paper that has this liberal leaning kind of finding, that it might be treated more um, leniently by a group of reviewers who, again, as we we talked about, might be also liberal, right? Because the field itself is is sort of a very liberal field, for, or like the political leanings of the people in the in the field are, are liberal. And so you might say, hey, you know, it's going to be treated fairly leniently if the claim being put forth is is sort of li- liberal friendly. And it might be treated a lot more harshly if it's um, a cons- more sort of a conservative leaning uh, finding or something. And so then, what you could, what could the issue that could arise is if you're treating pay, fi- you know, findings that are more liberal leaning more leniently, as you might just like stuff that shouldn't get published because it's not really robust, it's not really well done, just gets through and gets published in the scientific literature just because it had sort of a, a claim in it that aligned with how you view the world. 
And so that's, that's like why you might end up, why you might hypothesize that you could end up with, uh, you know, liberal leaning papers being less likely to replicate because, because of this kind of process where like this bias could occur. People are more lenient with those kind of work. They let the shoddier work kind of gets through. So that's like one example of how that might play out. And so we collected all the, we collected all these papers. We had folks rate the political slant of these, of these findings. And then, um, we could test whether the political leanings were associated or not with replicability. What we found was that the political slant of the research was not associated with whether or not it replicated. In other words, we didn't find any evidence that that mattered, whether a paper had more of a liberal leaning finding or more conservative leaning finding or moderate. Um, it did not seem to be very predictive of whether or not that paper replicates. What is you know, predictive of that are basic scientific things like how many people were in your study or how big of a finding was it? How big of an effect did you see right. in your study? And those are the things like kind of obviously that you might expect. Those are the things that stand up the time test of time of like, those are the things that are related to whether or not this work replicates. Um, and so it made us think like, well, you know, maybe there are various different forms of political bias that can emerge or liberal bias that can emerge. This doesn't seem, we don't seem to have great evidence that this is one of them here, um, that it plays out in this way. And the other kind of key thing I'll, I'll mention, and then I'll, I'll pause here is, um, I think one of the consequences of the conversation that was happening around that time, again, was that, and then as you sort of noted at, at the start here, is that the field is very liberal leaning. And so there's this thought that the bias in the field is pretty egregious, right? Because you might just think, oh, man, it's a field full of liberals. It's going to be like totally just overwhelmed by that group think. Everyone's thinking the same way. And um, one thing that we found in, in our data here that we were that I was just describing was that the, when you looked at kind of just the distribution of papers that were left leaning or right leaning, you might expect that the distribution of the research, like the findings that are getting published would really map on to the skew that you see in the field itself, right. That you have like, like you were like it's 50 to one, you know, Democrats or Republicans yeah. on a certain. Um, so you might expect that skew to be like so skewed. And what, we didn't actually find that. We found that um, there were more, slightly more liberal leaning findings than conservative leaning ones, but it wasn't nearly as egregious as it seemed folks were making it out to seem at the time and, and it did not map on to like just the numbers of people in the field. So all to say, even though there were many, even though there are many, many liberals, um, more liberals in the field, in the field of psychology and in other disciplines as we talked about, um, it doesn't seem to always one to one translate into like the research that they do, um, into the slant of their research. And so, surely, surely there is some degree of, you know, we are all people and we all have our own interests. But it didn't seem to be as biased as uh, as it as it was made to seem at the time. So that was that was kind of one one effort that we that we published uh, a few years ago. Yeah. What I. Well, first of all, you anticipated what my first follow-up question was going to be, which is exactly about what was the distribution of liberals to conservative findings. What I love about this is that you're, you know, it's easy to take the whole issue with a broad brush and kind of say, oh, you know, it's all, it's all bias, it's all bad, or, you know, what, what are you talking about? There's nothing wrong. And what's cool about this is, is it seems like you've, you've narrowed in on kind of a, a specific measurable aspect of this and test it in a rigorous way. I want to take this in two, I want to pull two threads here. And I'll start by saying, I find your results, I mean, your results about bias, I find actually not that hard to believe at all, right? This sort of like, it's one of those things that, that maybe if you're having a water cooler conversation about like, oh, there's so many liberals, right? And, uh, but if you think about it, it's like, yeah, a methodological rigor you know, anonymous reviewers who are yet not facing social pressure at the time that they're reviewing, for the most part, uh, are asked to specifically scrutinize the methods, right, and the and the rigor of the methods, and so they're 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 likely to do a much better job at that than say the media, right? Uh, right. So so basically, off the top, I'll say I believe you. Uh, l l two threads I want to pull. One is 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 a, related to kind of what this implies and what this doesn't imply in terms of this kind of specific charges that people lay against academia and get your thoughts on that. And then the second is kind of uh, steel manning the study itself as sort of, you know, what would somebody who 
either is surprised by or doesn't want to believe your findings, like what would what might they what might they say? Okay, so let's let's start with the uh, I think the more interesting one of kind of you know how 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 narrowly or broadly should we interpret this? Um, so the first thing is correct me if I'm wrong. You you did not look at the journal acceptances, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and and you did not look at me how they recovered in the media. Or did so you? So we didn't look at journal acceptances. We sort of looked at how they recovered in the media. So there's something called Altmetric, which is basically yeah, a yeah. cool tool to track, you know, media citations across different platforms. And we did look at the association between the political slant of the research and that measure of sort of publicity in the media. And we again did not find any associations there. What you find is like things like you know, Danny Kahneman's like, you know, Nobel Prize winner's work uh, on, you know, sort of like heuristic thinking and availability biases and stuff like that. That gets tons of attention or sure, yeah. uh, work on like cooper- cooperation and stuff that's like not clearly liberal leaning one way or the other, like, or, or, or politically leaning one way or the other. That's stuff that gets like tons of attention. So yeah, that it's that seemed to be the things that were getting the most media. So we looked at media, but not uh, journal acceptance. So let me try, I'm not a social psychologist, you know, I actually have been in a couple of papers recently collaborating with people who are social psychologists, you know, in almost quasi social psychology type work. Um, but I'm, a, you know, I'm an economist by training. Climate is, is, is one of my main areas currently. And so let, let, you know, having not studied this systematically like you have, let me just kind of try out what I think are my priors based on my anecdotal experience in climate and tell me to what extent you think they do or do not map on to what you see in your data and what you see in, in social psychology. So broadly, what my guess, the answer would be if you did a study of these different dimensions in climate, is that uh, similarly to what you said, you wouldn't see nearly as much bias as some conservatives might think in the methods, particularly in like physical climate science. Like one of the things that actually frustrates me about the right of center dialogue about climate is like, there are lots of things to pick at in terms of framing and media and like doomism in like the social domains of, of climate. But the physical science of climate is really solid. <laughs> uh, okay, so, so, so that's kind of one thing. But uh, where I think you would see biases is I do, I do suspect, and an and acquaintance of mine named Patrick Brown um, wrote kind of a viral article about this a few months ago, uh, making this case, you know, also anecdotally, but but sort of more rigorously than I will, um, that it's easier. It's 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 the the threshold of like you can never publish this anywhere versus uh, you can publish it somewhere. Maybe isn't that different for you know right coded or left coded papers? But the threshold of publishing in a really big journal for methodological rigor might be a little bit lower for ideologically pleasing papers. And so Patrick Brown, you know, gave the example of, you know, a, a paper that came out in Nature that, uh, that if I'm remembering right, compared the economic impacts of one and a half and the two, and two degree targets, but didn't look at the, the different mitigation costs. And so sort of said one and a half is better, but kind of only looking at half the ledger. And then, and then Patrick Brown, the person writing this article, uh, tried to submit a paper that looked at both half the ledger and came to the opposite conclusion that, you know, two is better than one and a half. And, and nature rejected it. And I think he ended up publishing it in plus one. So he just he uses that as an anecdotal, uh, an anecdotal example. I find that plausible. I think the media bias also exists, but they're unlike academia, which is very left-leaning, there are me- large media echo chambers on both sides. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, if you want a kind of hilarious example of this, uh, there's a single author at the Heartland Institute, okay, the same person who... Two years ago, when I published a paper that argued that the hot climate scenarios were unrealistically hot, she wrote this article about my paper that basically, you know, in slightly more words, said I was this brave truth teller, like, uh, you know, correcting the record, right? And then Mm -hmm. uh, just recently, I had another paper come out that estimated that uh, the public distaste for climate denial might have been large enough to cost Trump the 2020 election. And then she wrote, the same person wrote this article uh, again, in both cases, naming me personally, and this time saying I was a Democratic shill. I was trying to manipulate voters. Right? <laughs> and I had a lot of fun pointing <laughs> out that the same person wrote these two articles. Uh, yeah. But, but, but uh, you know, to, to, to step, to zoom back out from that, you know, I would, I would say I've published climate papers that some that are more left-coded and some that are more right-coded. And I find that 
I don't find a, a difference at all in how much coverage I get, but I find a huge difference in kind of who covers it and how they cover it. How do they cover it? Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. and, and I, and, and I, and I, I, I do, you know, while I, uh, uh, you know, I'm very conscious in emphasizing the and policing the rigor of my own work. Uh, I also, you know, I find media, the way media interacts with my research on both left and right, they tend to be pretty credulous. I mean, they tend to be interested to the extent that it fits their narrative and, and with a few exceptions, but in most cases, they tend to be pretty credulous about the methods. And again, I think I use pretty good methods, but, you know, most of the time I'm not being pushed that hard uh, right. you know, on either side. Right. And they're, and, and they're not scientists, uh, they're yeah, trained yeah, yeah. scientifically. So it makes sense that they wouldn't, you know, dive in as much. Yeah. And so I guess what I'm saying is like, if you think about how that translates to alt metric scores, you know, uh, I don't actually, if I think about like my most cited in the media, right coded paper and my most cited in the media left coded paper, I think they both have alt metric scores in the ballpark of 600. Um, mm-hmm. and so, and so there's kind of, there's, I would say it's like it's two biases that cancel each other out in a way that you know wouldn't wouldn't show up in your data, or the cancel the fact that they cancel out would show up in your data um, because right. it it's not that there's no media it's bias; sort of it's just that media bias exists on both sides. And there's you know within a particular media organization, there might be more liberals and more conservatives, but overall, there's kind of roughly equal number of liberal and conservative media outlets. Uh, and same thing, kind of on on, on social media. So what, what's your thought on the journals? Like, like if, if somebody said, imagine somebody sent you Patrick Brown's article about climate and said, I bet this happens in social psychology too. What would be your answer? Yeah. So the idea that if you send it, send, send a paper to a journal, that's, um, like more controversial to like a liberal narrative that it would be held to a higher bar. Yeah. And vice versa, right. If something was really pleasing yeah. to, you know, like if you want an extreme example this isn't quite social psychology, but there was a paper that came out, I believe in science a few years ago that looked at, you know, people all over the world to see, um, you know, where could you find like evidence of hybridization with Neanderthals? And what they happened to find was that the only population that did not have any evidence of hybridization with Neanderthals was Africans. Okay. And I remember mm-hmm. at the time some people saying, would science have published that if the finding had happened to be the opposite? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think your, your, your examples are well taken. I think the journal piece of it is, is tricky because I think there's a lot of things that are going on in that peer review, right? And it's, you're going to get different reviewers. Sometimes the reviewers really don't even agree with themselves. Like the reliability of peer reviewers is super low. Totally. You know, everyone complains about reviewer two because reviewer one is like, I like this. And reviewer two is like, this is the worst paper I've ever seen. So and then ultimately, it's the editor who's going to look at those reviews and sort of take a big picture state stance of, you know, should we send the, should we get a, can, can you revise this paper and send it back to us? Or, or are we chopping you off the knees and sending you on to the next journal? Because we don't, we don't want to publish you here. So, yeah, I mean, I think I could see, I mean, I think I agree that like, there are going to be forms of bias that emerge on both sides and cer- certain degrees in certain cases. I, I don't know if it's like so systematic that um, I think you I think it's sort of on the on the edges like you'd have to have a pretty controversial paper for that bias to kind of come up and then it makes me think of like well why is it so controversial is it controversial because it's just like a taboo topic to talk about or is it controversial because like it's not maybe it's not only taboo but also like it's flying in the face of like what we currently know right so if you publish a right. paper that were like that were that was like you know, women aren't as smart as men or something. And then you're like, we know women have like outpaced men in earning college degrees for the past like 40 years or whatever. Right. Then I would be like, well, I don't know. I should like take a closer look at this paper that you're writing. Cause like it's contrasting my priors, which are informed by, you know, the scientific evidence. And so it's sort of like, to what degree are your priors based in the literature that you've read and, and, and your, your kind of more empirical understanding of the world Versus as a reviewer, are you just sort of like, oh, they're they're saying, you know, that, um, I don't know, yeah, that like women aren't able to do math as well as men or I don't know, something that like you're some other sort of claim where you're maybe like wondering if that's like so, if that's like completely invalid or not. But I can't think of one off the top of my head. But um, So you basically like, just just to break this down a little bit, you're, and actually first, quick sidebar, correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding before anyone in our audience misunderstands what you were saying a second ago. My understanding of the literature is that 
the mean IQ of women and men is basically identical. Um, yeah. And the, and women do tend to do better in school on average. And I think that traces to largely their, um, on average, more conscientious, particularly when they're younger because they're mature faster. Some people like Richard Reeves argue that school systems are more tilted to them or whatever. We don't need to get in the debate, but, but just to be yeah. clear, I think you, your point was, which is well taken is that men are not smarter than women, but I just want to make sure you, Right. To give you the opportunity yeah. to clarify, you're also not saying that women are smarter than men, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 I, um, okay. So, so breaking into, in case that was, yeah. Yeah. You know, you never, yeah. you never know who's, who's going to be listening, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, good point. The, and by the way, if, it, it, all ideas are welcome. So if you did want to make that case, please do. Don't, don't, don't feel like I'm, I'm shutting you down. Um, no, no, no. Well, let's, so let's pull, pull two threads there, right? I think at the start, you, what you described is like very rational Bayesian reasoning, right? So my favorite example of this, because it has absolutely no social controversy whatsoever, was there was a famous paper that I think came out in science, I think science, maybe nature, that claimed to find an arsenic-based life form, right? <laughs> um, and it turns out that the, that the paper was wrong. I, I, I think it was retracted, and I can't remember... I want to say it was an honest mistake, but I, I can't remember why it was retracted. But but basically, you know, so it came out in science, right? It had, and this is an example where uh, sensationalism bias can actually work against confirmation bias, right? Because totally, cause, yeah. You know, yeah. The, we did not find the arsenic-based life form paper it doesn't get published in science, probably, right? Uh, right. But also, right. people were kind of immediately uh, incredulous about it because there was decades of of evidence from molecular biology that you know, that I'm on a, not, not an expert on, but I gather from reading about it, suggested to experts that this was a very, very unlikely thing to find. And, you know, so similarly, if I saw a paper that said that, you know, climate change isn't caused by CO2 emissions, it's caused by the sun, um, I probably, you know, as somebody who prides myself on being politically balanced and not politically <clears throat> biased, would still probably read that paper more carefully. Um, right. And a, a related and, and then, and the second thing you were describing is like people not say, not applying Bayesian reasoning, but people saying like this just like offends me, right? Um, and occasionally you do see that. So my favorite example of that because it's like a accidental control experiment is um, there's a uh, a researcher. I think her name is Badur Al Shebli. She's at okay. uh, anyway. So she she had two papers that came out a couple years apart in Nature Communications. Um, and they both used essentially the same methodology. And one found, the headline finding of one of them was that ethnically diverse scientific teams are better. I can't remember what the measure was, uh, probably citations or something, uh, innovation. Mm -hmm. Again, I can't remember the measure, but, but the gist of it was ethnically diverse scientific teams do better. And, you know, that, that was published to large fanfare. You know, everybody loved it. Then a couple of years later, she had a paper also in Nature Communication. So same author in the same journal whose headline finding was something along the lines of uh, female trainees who have female mentors, like oh, graduate yeah. advisors, mm -hmm. don't right. do quite as well in their careers on average as female trainees who have male mentors. Um, right. And, and, you know, just for what it's worth, uh, you know, so a lot of people were, were offended by that finding. And the paper, I believe, did get retracted and she put some tortured apology out. Um, ostensibly because of the methodology, but of course nobody has to retract the other paper that used the exact same methodology, right? So clearly an mm -hmm. example, I think, in that case of, of bias. And, and what's interesting that too is like the my interpretation of that, I think there was a, a, a more plausible and less inflammatory interpretation of that same result, which is that I believe it's the case that that studies, I think I've seen a study in ecology that suggests that female trainees are more likely to select a female mentor because she's female. Mm -hmm. um, and so if that's true, right, if, 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 if female trainees are selecting female mentors on average more for non, you know, excellence related reasons, then irrespective of what the distribution of talent is among the mentors, you would expect, I think, to find the result that she found. Right. And so which then also, you know, I think, again, I think that's more plausible and also less, less, less offensive, right? People were, the, the thing that people found offensive was that, you know, that there was this implication that, that female, um, the female mentors weren't as good or something. So well, I, just, I also want to just, so what do you think about cases like, about cases like that? Yeah, I was just going to jump in and say, like, I think 
you know, it's complicated. I think that, for example, you were you were c- contrasting the you know ethnically diverse teams do best with the uh, um, you know the female mentor work and saying that was a clear case of bias. And and I I just want to say like I feel like that. It seems less clear because I, I think even though I think it depends on like kind of your causal understanding of the of the world and depends on like again these specific measures and so I I, I haven't read these papers uh, very closely so I, I won't hang my hat too too heavily on it but um, it's like you know I think there's there's been a lot of work that's shown uh, how women are discrimi- discriminated against in STEM and uh, it's a very a challenging kind of environment sometimes to be in. Um, and so to me, it feels like, you know, that, that could be true about, uh, what it means to be like a female academic and the ethnically diverse piece of it. I was just having a conversation with a colleague yesterday, actually about like collective performance and teams and like, when is it better to be diverse versus not? And, and it's like for simple coordination tasks, it's actually better to be homogenous, but if it's like more creative sure. solution stuff, it's, so I think it's like, I'd have to look at what the exact measure is for that, but I guess I could see, I guess I guess I should look more closely at the at that to to evaluate, but I I don't I wouldn't at face value say look obviously bias. Um, well, let me just let me let me let me clarify my my claim of bias, right? So my my claim of bias, I think basically there were two things that were going on. So so the you know the the people on Twitter when it when it was still Twitter and when this paper came out, right, uh, were saying this paper offends me, right? That's basically a moral claim. I think. I'm happy with people saying that the moral implications of the second paper were more inflammatory than the moral implications of the first paper. My claim of bias is, is separate from that, right? The, the journal, what happened, what happened after the Twitter storm was the journal basically, I think, asked the authors to correct and eventually retracted the paper, not because it was offensive, but because people said this methodology is too simple and kind of not appropriate for the claims you're making. And that's where I'm claiming bias is that if that was true, that would also, I think, be grounds to retract the other paper. But nobody right. suggested they do that and they weren't asked to do that. And, and, and right. so the, 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 the bias interpretation of that story is that the, a different standard of methodological rigor was applied to the two papers because on average people had a different moral reaction to the implications of the two findings. Right. And I think, and I think you make a, a good point about the subjectivity of those standards. Because it's like you could view it and say this author's second paper was um, I don't know her I don't know her or, or the work super well, but you could say that that second work second paper that came out was wasn't like very strong science, and so no, it didn't really deserve to be published. But then you're saying you know by inference the first paper should also say like well that wasn't really strong work either. Or if you're saying that the first work was sufficiently strong enough, then I guess the second work should reasonably right. be also strong. That's enough. the case I'm making. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'd have to look more closely at the methods of those papers to make my own like more informed judgment about that. But um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and this actually leads naturally into one of the other questions I was going to ask you in general about the bias topic. So my impression of social psychology as an outsider is that is that although I think demographically you are super politically homogenous, I think it's fairly well established fact. I actually think social psychologists probably because of the nature of your field are a lot more curious about politically diverse questions than many other, you know, equally homogenous fields are, right? Like, like I, I don't think it's a coincidence. Uh, do you know Smriti Mehta? She's a, a graduate student at Berkeley. Anyway, I had her mm-hmm. on, on, on the podcast uh, a while ago and, and we were talking about this, right? Uh, she's a member of Heterox Academy too. And, and I was saying to her, I don't think it's a coincidence that, most of the founders of Heterodox Academy and many of the prominent voices in Heterodox Academy come from your field, right? Because <laughs> because the the phenomenon of political polarization and uh, right. you know liberal bias, if it whether or not it exists, is just like inherently fascinating to the social psychologist. And so even if yeah, like you're social, invested in the answer, question. you kind of you kind of want to study it. So so my so my question is is like given that you found that there actually was quite a large. Uh, diversity of studies, and you said you had a politically balanced reviewer or rater set. The raters, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. Is the problem of like question selection in social psychology more limited, to kind of, to the fringes than to the mainstream? Right, like, like you know, uh, to you know, to give two examples to illustrate my point. Like, if I was a grad student going starting out in social psychology, 
might I be okay if I wanted to study like the effects of stable families on mental health or something, but maybe not mm-hmm. okay if I wanted to study something like race and IQ? Like, you know what I mean? Is, is it really just the like right. really, really, really toxic stuff on the fringe that's getting shut out? Or is there kind of a broader, a, a broader, um, limitation of yeah. like both what is, what is the charge for, that you're hearing coming from heterodox uh, social psychologists and kind of what would be your guess of what the answer is? Yeah, I think, I think you're right that it's, it's less like, I, I know a, a number of folks who, who study, uh, you know, family structure or the importance of, of that as a unit, which you could say is conser- you know, more conservative coded and this and that more traditional in its values. And this. so I think that those, you know, number of people study romantic relationships and families and they might, they might look at its negative associations or they might just look at what the outcomes are. I think yeah. what's important is like, what do you, the key is like, what are you measuring? Right. Cause oftentimes right. you can find, um, I don't want to say you can always find what you're looking for cause you can't always find that, but you can often find some element of something. So if I were to look, for example, of like of a negative association of, you know, f- broken homes, so to speak, you know, families that torn apart yeah. and, and how that affects the, you know, the youth and their education or attainment or their men or their mental well-being. You could pick a number of different outcomes and probably on one outcome, you might see that there's some sort of negative effect, but then you might pick another outcome and recast it and say, you know, we're going to look at resilience. We're going to look at right. the people's ability to overcome the way. And all of a sudden you find that, you know, this other outcome people, you know, actually they, they show some, you can, when you frame it this way and you think about it from another, another perspective, you realize that this other outcome is positively affected by it. So I guess I'll just say that like, I sort of feel like there can be positive and negative outcomes. And it's a lot of it is like, what is spelling out very clearly? Like, what is your theory about? What is your hypothesis? What are you measuring? What can you speak to? What can you not speak to? Acknowledging that there are like various complex factors that go into this. And it's not just always a straightforward, straightforward story of like, this thing is good and this thing is bad. It's often like a little bit more complicated. Right. Um, in, in a sense, your your work on political bias in academia kind of illustrates this, right? If you sort of narrow down on a specific thing, if you right. to take in a simple example, if you just look at the demographics of faculty, it's obviously true. If you look at, you know, the specific measure of impact that you looked at, it doesn't seem to be uh, there right. much. But are, is your, so is your point that that's, that what we pick and what we frame is, you know, an area to look for bias where maybe you haven't found it, or was it more specifically to push back on the conservative coded notion that maybe was implied in my, uh, my example that stable families on average, uh, growing no, up stable family was, on average was, leads to, you know, good socioeconomic outcomes. Yeah, no, it, it was mostly to say that I think it's that the viewpoints you were, I think you were asking about view, like extremity of viewpoints and sort of like yeah. what's, yeah. Are, are basically are there social psychologists who study some of these uh, topics or is the topic range so, so like small because it's such a homo- liberally homogenous group. And I was saying, I think there is a range. I, I think they, they're, for example, are, there are probably more social psychologists who study things around like stereotyping and prejudice which is often thought about in the way that our society works, which is stereotype prejudice towards, you know, uh, marginalized folks. Uh, you sure, could also yeah. study stereotyping and prejudice towards, you know, powerful CEOs and say, or oh, conservatives, you know, right? Which that or paper that yeah. you mentioned did, yeah. Right. So like, yeah, you can pick different uh, people to study with that. But I, I would say that, that you probably have more folks studying that than you do who study like, you know, the more conservative, conservative coded topics, but I, I don't think the range is so small. And I think the, where you start to see, uh, you know, where you, where you'd probably start to see people shut off is like where you were saying it's kind of like, um, you know, race and IQ type implications or work that people are doing that it seems kind of, uh, beyond the bounds of, of what we're from our, from our, from our scientific data, like what we're, interested yeah. in studying based on what we know. So I think that's kind of where I would draw. So I think that's kind of the, the point. Yeah. I want to ask you a quick follow-up question about that. Cause um, I'm thinking about my episode with, with Corey Clark and, and, you know, I think of myself as a advocate against political bias for open inquiry. And, and she maybe even is more extreme than I am kind of in that direction, you know, kind of the like study everything. Um, mm-hmm. And so, so, so one of the things that, one of the questions I tried to push her on is like, you know, while it does seem intuitively uh, scientific to say we should never, given that we're going to ask a question, we should never say a particular answer is out of bounds. 
because that's going to mm -hmm. you know pollute the fact finding process, right? So in mm -hmm. that example of that scientific paper about you know Neanderthal hybridization, right? If 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 we had imposed if we imposed a a filter on papers like that that say you know you can only publish it with the correct answer, right? For example, you know the the Badur El Shelby or El Shebli, excuse me, example. Of, of female mentors, right? Like, like if we say we're not going to retract that paper if it has the correct finding, personally, I see the case that that's inherently scientifically corrupting. But you know, maybe more so than than more pure academic freedom advocates <laughs> than I am, I, I do see a case for saying in and narrowly, but but still for saying that that there are some questions. There's nothing. I don't think inherently polluting, at least to the same degree, about saying that some questions maybe should be out of bounds. So the extreme example that I think is super uncontroversial is like, we don't want people doing, you know, open source bioweapons research in universities on the public dime, right? Even closed right. sorts gain of function research has become super controversial, I think, for, for a good reason, right? If you think about the, the recent stuff about, about COVID origin. So I think if you accept that, if you accept that there's some limit on questions that we allowed to ask, then I think it is reasonable to take some of these really inflammatory questions like race and IQ and ask, you know, is that a question that basically nothing good can come from trying to answer <laughs> in terms of, in terms of mm -hmm. society? And, and if we, and if we did, would it not be reasonable then for scientific enterprises to say, we're not going to fund research on that question and we're not going to hire if you study that question. I don't particularly want to talk any further about that question because I just don't like it. And, <laughs> you know, I, yeah. uh, I, I believe in academic freedom. I think if people have already been funded to study that question and they publish a paper, you shouldn't fire them. That's, that's, that's a different question, right? But, uh, right. but I, I personally have no interest in that question. Um, yeah. but, but, but what do you think about the general argument that, you know, even a pretty pro-free speech stance can can still admit that there's a line that puts some questions out of bounds. Do you agree with that or not? And if you do, like, uh, how should we decide of sort of where to draw that line? Yeah, man, what a great question. The, the, the question of where to draw that line is, is a very, very hard question because it sort of depends on who you ask and what you think the outcomes of it will be and what you, who, you know, how negative the outcomes will be will depend on who you ask. And so it's like a super thorny, complex question. Um, I think I definitely, to, to your first question, I definitely think you can have people who are, who are people who are open-minded, who are curious people who try and take that. I mean, you know, this is a free mind podca podcast. People who listen to this might also be people who have open minds of inquiry and curiosity. And I think it's totally uh, true that, that you can have that and still find an outer edge where you say, this seems like a question that could be problematic for a lot of reasons to, to dive into and, uh, you know, it starts to maybe get into kind of like trolling spheres where you're like, you're asking these questions to seemingly rile things up more so than because you think that there's some, uh, amazing scientific understanding that we're going to draw. And, and, and again, this becomes very, very complex in, in social, uh, social sciences, in a way that's sometimes I think different from physical scientists, right? Like if we were trying to understand the universe, which you know, we are, uh, I don't know how I would cap it would for like astronomers or, you know, physicists. And I would say, you know, don't ask that question. I was, well, I don't know, like let's bend, bend, bend around the, the experiments and the laws and see what you can figure out because that, that's useful. But when you move into the social sciences, it becomes much, much trickier. So I think, but I think that your, your first point is, is well taken that, you know, people can have open minds of inquiry and curiosity about things, but still sort of draw lines and, and where, where to draw those lines. Like I said, that is a very complicated question because, you know, your example of, of, you know, bioweapons or missile weapons of mass, mass destruction. And, and it's like some things you could see very quickly having an immediate mass catastrophic outcome. Some things you might say, well, this would be sort of like problematic, but like it wouldn't lead to 8 billion deaths. Um, and so again, it's, it's like, well, how do you want to quantify this? And are we in a position to sort of set the like uh, moral lines of what's okay and what's not ourselves? And yeah, I think that's, I don't, I don't think there's a clear, I don't feel like there's a clear answer of exactly where to set that line because I think in part what what we decide is okay and not okay is, is a very social thing. 
you know, I also study morality and, and I know that that is a very social process of us working out together what's okay and what's not okay. So yeah, you're, I don't know where, where would you, where would you draw the line? You know, it's like, I, well, you're totally you're right. Your, so, so, yeah. so, uh, you're totally right. It's a social process and that anticipates my follow up question. But first, let me try to answer your question because I think it's a great question. So I, I guess I would try as much as I could to, to anticipate the, you know, the distribution of, of, of benefit and harm to society of studying it uh, yep. with some game theory considerations too, right? So for example, you know, I don't like nuclear weapons, but I'm glad that we have them because China is not going to get rid of them if we do, right? And I think that there's some, you know, if you're more of a scientific domain, I think some areas that get tricky in that domain is like, uh, if you think about AI or even things like designer babies, you know, genetic enhancement, like I'm pretty sure China is going to do those things, whether we do them or not. And and so I do factor that a little bit into my thinking about whether or not we should do it, even though like Mm -hmm. if America was an island, um, the cost benefit might be different. Um, I think, you know, not to return to the topic that I hate, but I think where I'm sympathetic to the people who, who don't want study of that topic (laughs) or raising IQ is that as far as I've seen articulated, the biggest harm that could come from studying that is that we have these catastrophic outcomes in our education system in some of our most disadvantaged communities and people might stop caring about that. And I find that pretty plausible that that if, you know, if we widely accepted the say Nathan Kofnas uh, view on that topic, that people might, you know, I mean, Charles Murray, I think literally made that connection directly in terms of his policy recommendations in the bell curve. Right. And then on the other side, what I hear, you know, people saying we should study that say is their biggest concern is that, you know, if we didn't study that and kind of find what they think the answer is going to be, then we're going to assume that, you know, equal outcomes is the only possible option without discrimination. And so we might, you know, uh, discriminate unfairly to produce outcomes that we kind of aren't the correct null hypothesis. And that I actually find pretty implausible because there's many, many other paths to get to we shouldn't discriminate and you might not expect a perfectly balanced demographics in every field um, that don't require making assumptions about, you know, their research on IQ. So, so that's sort of an example of, you know, again, I'm more (laughs) uncomfortable with somebody like saying, okay, we, you know, in the case of Nathan Kofnast, who I think was fired recently in in, in Cambridge, right? The, if you're going to bring somebody in who says, I'm going to study this topic, right? And you bring them in, and then you don't like what they find and then you fire them. I'm against that, right? And so I'm, I was glad to see, you know, people across the spectrum, you know, luminaries in Cambridge basically saying, you know, he, should, he shouldn't he should have been fired on academic freedom grounds, even though, you know, his work is icky, right? Is kind of what they said, right? Mm, uh, right. Uh, but I, I'm totally okay with Cambridge saying, you know, we're not going to have a position on that topic because because that's just not a... And, 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 and by the way, the, I may be making a value judgment there, you know, even though I tried to frame it in like a benefit to society and the expectation, but we make that kind of judgment all the time in terms of deciding what's interesting. Right. Um, right. You know, like if I send a uh, thing that says, you know, I want to study, you know, how fruit bats see color and somebody's like, well, I'm not interested in that. Like, I'm not going to go like bias. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. But but let's come back a little bit to the, to the, to the, to the social thing because I, I think an argument or maybe a, a counter argument or maybe a rejoinder that that conservatives would make to what we've just been discussing that I, I think I am somewhat sympathetic to is that we do hold in some fields I actually think less social psychology than most of the social sciences but in some and, and mix up maybe econ um, in, in in some social science field it seems like we do hold right leaning or right coded questions to a much lo- uh, a higher level of scrutiny for danger than left. So kind of, let me just give you two anecdotal examples to, to get your thoughts on. So the first is, you know, on the right, I was involved recently in planning what was going to be a workshop on the interdisciplinary consequences of human population decline. Like if, you know, mm-hmm. birth rates stay low, population might peak in mm-hmm. mid-century, that upends models and thinking in a lot of different disciplines, right? Um, yep. And, you know, uh, and not only were we not going to have a, you know, Malthusian hardcore or like, a, you know, women should go back to the kitchen kind of person, right? 
we 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 literally had a uh, one of our speakers invited to criticize that, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and we just were interested in like, look, you know, for example, as an economist, like I invited economists to come and talk about how population decline breaks endogenous growth models, right? Chad, Chad Jones is an, uh, he wasn't our speaker, but, but, you know, he's somebody at Stanford who's, who's written really influential paper on that. Okay. That, that, uh, that workshop was, uh, was canceled after the speakers had been invited basically because of a, uh, somebody had put, there was a, ca- a call put out for internal abstracts, right. To kind of fill out the program beyond the keynotes. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the co one of my co-organizers had put a banner photo on this call for abstracts that was a picture of a Danish advertisement trying to from the government trying to raise their birth rate. So imagine a bunch of Danish babies with some Danish writing. And and okay. what I gather happened was somebody uh complained to, you know, the person pulling the purse strings that, you know, white babies on a photo on a uh thing about population decline means that this must be, you know, a far right uh, fascist project. And without oh, consulting anybody, we have to repopulate the earth with just white babies. Is that was like the inference that people were drawing? I, I guess I don't know. I, this is all things I heard secondhand. But but the the end result was the person pulling the pull strings. Um, after you know we had a date and confirmed high profile speakers pulled the plug in the whole thing and uninvited everybody. You know without basically consulting most of the organizers, <laughs> right? So that's sort of one yeah. example. And, and and also without asking for clarification on like. Are you planning to have a bunch of you know far right natalists, right? Yeah, <laughs> and so right, would have right, been right. no. Uh, right. So so now contrast that with I believe it's the case that one of the most assigned and widely cited books in education, which is maybe the field where you'd want to you know worry about danger the most because you're impressionable children, is Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Now I've read that book. It literally praises Mao, who's maybe the deadliest dictator in human history. Paulo Freire has a long record of praising Mao and other communist dictators. He also went to implement his ideas in Guinea-Bissau and basically wrecked their education system. And so I think a lot of conservatives look at that and, the, and basically say, like, is, is, there not, is there not bias there? Is there, is there not? And, 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 and at what point is kind of a, a potential harm, you know, used in kind of an imaginary way as a cudgel, right? Like the, you know, you know what I mean? What, what, what's what's yeah. your thought? Yeah, I mean, well, so first of all, sorry to hear about the workshop getting pulled. I that sounds like a, a total uh, miscommunication of, of things going on. Uh, it's I think interesting to think about like the yeah, yeah, yeah. human population decline and 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 what you know, like you said, it speaks to all different sorts of fields. So to me, that that seems like sort of I, I would be interested to hear what what folks were thinking about the fact that the purse strings were pulled on it and the thing got canceled. Um, I, you know, I assume I don't know the details, but was it just like the organizer was worried politically of how this would look. Uh, it, it, it also seems it wasn't like the organizers. Wasn't oh, so, or, so sorry, the organizers, for, the funders. Yeah, it was, and again, I'm, uh, I like calling phenomena out, but I don't like people calling people out. And that's why I'm, right. I'm being a little yeah, bit vague. Sure, sure. Basically the, there's a, u, there, you know, there's a unit that had a call for workshop proposals that this was submitted to. Yeah. And, 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 and reviewed and funded. Um, yeah. And then, and somebody who was neither the kind of head of this unit nor part of or- the organizing team um, right. saw this poster and panicked um, right. and basically complained. Again, didn't come as far as I know to the organizing team, but but went to the the boss right. and said, yeah. you know, now I, I don't think they said, as far as I know, no, they didn't say like, oh, these organizers are bad people, you know, trying to bring fascism into the university or something. But they basically said like, this has undertones of the far right that kind of uh, pose a huge reputational threat to our organization. And, and so we, sh- we shouldn't do that. And I think in the, my hunch is that the leader who was new to the job at the time might make a different decision today, but at, at the yeah. time they're new to their position, you know, you, it's all scary to kind of make up, to, to kind of feel like you're sticking your neck out, right. When you're, when you're brand new. Right. And so yeah. And so they, again, not, not because they thought we were bad people that, you know, the, the leader actually apologized profusely to us, but basically said like, you know, the gist of it was this concern has been raised about reputational risk to our unit. If we go through with this, um, I agree with that. Um, and then there was a little bit of like a pretense of, you know, well, it's also, we need the right experts on demography, which I, I, to be honest, I think was a bit of a fig leaf. 
you know, and, and yeah. so that's what we're not going for. But it wasn't like, you know, well, we think you're fascist or something. <laughs> right, right, yeah. yeah. And I guess what I was going to say is that I think the, uh, well, I guess a few things. One is that the the claim of bias, I think, needs to be evaluated, like, systematically, right? Like, if you sure. have, like, one anecdote and another anecdote, and you're like, isn't that bias? It's like, well, it seems like it. But when we talk about these, like, system-level, societal-level things, like, I think the that the empirical data needs to be Need, needs to be as big as it can be to, to speak to those kinds of big issues. Uh, yeah, I would have you know, also handled that, you know, de- you know, talk to the organizer. And this sounds like a, like an unfortunate uh, fallout uh, and like fear from a certain situational feature, like so this person was new and all sorts of things. And then on the like education, uh, uh, on the education piece in the, in the book, I, I haven't read that, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I could see that like if it feels like that is the most read book, is it because people just like that book a lot? Is it because uh, we are like in, indoctrinating our youth with this book and so they're being forced to read it against their will? I, d- I don't know. I, I I also just think about the fact that like if that book sort of, um, and again, forgive me that I that I'm not familiar with it, but if that book is sort of um, pushing on like communist type ideologies or on like dictators, you know, <laughs> there's so, so many thoughts. I, I feel like, you know, we live in a capitalist society, like every, every aspect of our like indoctrination into the country is like through a kind of a capitalist lens. And like when communism was more of a thing uh, or there was a, you know, more of a, a push for it, uh, you know, people were blacklisted. And so like, there's been many instances of like a rejection of that ideology in our society uh, and of like, and I'm not for banning Frera for the record. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I guess yeah, I'm yeah, just yeah. sort of thinking like, when you're like, is that not bias? I'm like, well, I don't, I mean, what do you mean by that? Like, cause I, I feel like there's so many uh, like, it would be weird for me to be like, is it not biased that people were blacklisted? You know, like that, that'd be like a weird question to ask right but it would be like the inverse of sort of what of what you're suggesting i think so i guess i feel like yeah i mean there are i guess what i agree with is that there are definitely camps of of people with political views that will like clash we and that's like the most trivial obvious thing to say but yeah i like in terms of education right and teaching we also know that like students are impacted more by their peers than they are by their professors and so it's not like professors are you know having them drink the liberal Kool-Aid, so to speak, it's, it's, you know, lots of, again, students are self-selecting into majors that they care about the things like if you go into finance or business or computer science, like you're in a totally different environment than if you go into like anthropology or history. And so people are self-selecting into stuff that interests them based on their experiences, their family background, all this kind of stuff. And, and their peers are having a really big influence on them. And it's not like university, uh, students are always like heavily skewed on the political spectrum one way or the other. Certainly like some at universities. flagship schools, certainly not. Yeah. Yeah. In, yeah. In, yeah. In, exactly. In elite private schools on the, in the Northeast, they are a little bit. Um, right. And, and like, you could yeah. always, you know, cherry pick, like, you know, NYU might be more liberal and BYU might be more, you know, you could always like find. Well, but let me call that a little bit. So young people as a whole skew left a little bit. It's actually changing a little bit among men recently. Um, yeah. Men and women. Yeah. And, uh, and college educated people skew left also. Right. So, right. so if you, if you try to look for what are the most, there was a study I read a while ago that, that was look, trying to look at like, what are the most politically representative of the country's student bodies? And it actually tends to be flagship public schools in deep red States like university of Arkansas, I think was like the single most representative yeah. student body of the country. Um, so it is a mm. little bit skewed, but, but not because, on a, on the on the whole, not because the right. colleges are are selecting it that way. There's an argument right. which I've never been on admissions committee in an Ivy League school, so I can't speak to the truth of it or not. But there is a claim that's been made that recently, in in response to some of the uh, Gaza, you know, Israel protests, uh, right. that that Ivy League schools, as part of their DEI projects in the last five to ten years, have been selecting students partly for their track records of activism and looking for activism in a left coded way, right? You're not looking for somebody who's right. like their fi- high school fed sock chair or something. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And so, and so, and so if, if to the extent they're doing that, which again, I don't, I don't know, I haven't seen the data, 
Um, but that's the claim. If that claim were true, I would find it plausible that you would then disproportionately select people, not just with left views, but probably with kind of very, very left views in those schools. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I could, I, I, I could, I agree with that. I could see that. Yeah. And one, and one other point, just following up on something you said earlier, uh, my read of the evidence is, is absolutely consistent with what you said, that although some professors probably are trying to indoctrinate, we're not very good at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Largely because as, as much as we think we're know, excellent educators, the, yeah. I, I think I, I think the evidence. I think the jury's still out because people are just starting to look into that. I, I find it plausible that you might find evidence of indoctrination in K twelve. And actually, uh, you know, just the last episode I, I did was with Heidi Ganahl, who uh, recently ran for governor as a Republican in Colorado, and she's she's an, an education advocate. Um, and that's where you know she thinks the action is. And again, I haven't, as far as I know, there aren't data, <laughs> uh, but, yeah. but, but my prior would be the same that if you were looking for like liberal influence bias. Okay. So, so I, I want to say like, I think it's important yeah. to look at like, what do we mean by indoctrination? Like when I think of K through 12 and you're like learning like math and English and it's like, what are the subjects, what subset of the subjects are we talking about that? Cause things you know, like American like, history, like, right? Right. Uh, and it's like, what, and does indoctrination mean like we are not teaching about like slavery? You know, I don't think people would say, oh, that's indoctrination no. if you teach about slavery. slavery Absolutely right? so not. It's like, yeah. I mean, maybe and occasional I don't, I don't, wackos, but, but certainly not uh, the right. person I was talking to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So then I'm thinking like, you know, so when, what does that mean that we think critically about like market systems, like how capitalism works in this way and socialism works in this other way and the various like complexities of geopolitical events around the world. You know, I mean, I, so I'm sort of like, well, what do we mean by indoctrinating? Like, what are we really indoctrinating anyone with? Like what, you know, I'd be curious yeah, if there's like a clear examples of that. Yeah. Again, you know, I, uh, as far as I know, there, there has not been a systematic analysis, at least that this been made public because I would, I think I would have seen it and, and I would have read it with fascination. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. The, you know, the areas where I find it plausible again, is on some of the, some of the, bigger stuff, right? So, so, you know, our student, and, and I also, I want to clarify, I suspect it strongly varies regionally and there's probably a doctrination of many different varieties regionally, right? So, but if I was right. sending to my, you know, if I was sending my kids to, and this is something, you know, I've thought about because my kids are, are racially mixed. Um, if I sent my kids to public school in a major city, a major liberal city kind of post 2020, I would worry a little bit about them getting a message that, you know, your the color of your skin will hold you back, even though objectively my kids are some of the most privileged people in America, right? Mm. <laughs> I do worry a yeah. little bit that, you know, they'll learn a lot about the evils of capitalism and more so than they'll learn about the fact that the, you know, only rich societies in the history of the world until, you know, 10 minutes ago had markets as the core of their economy and also the deadliest dictatorships in history were all communist, right? <laughs> um, right? I worry that my kids in the context of climate change will hear about all the doom and gloom, but won't hear about the fact that death rates and damage rates from natural disasters have been in decline for decades, right? The, right. So, so those are sort of examples. And, and in the climate ones, I will say like having taught those facts to undergrads who come out of high school disproportionately from liberal parts of the country, uh, that does scan, you know, I, I regularly get students who take my third year climate macroeconomics class or environmental macroeconomics class, uh, who, who were like shocked by the, by those data points. And, you know, we'll, we'll say kind of, thank you for helping me feel hopeful again. Right. Uh, that's not everybody, but, but it's, it's a noticeable, it's a noticeable fraction. And, and certainly, you know, I've never had a student come up to me and say, you know, you're the first person who told me that global warming is real. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so that's sort of where I find it plausible. Comes- yeah. But do you think that that comes from education, education in high, like I didn't take climate change in high school. Like, do you think that comes from the media or do you think that comes from educators in high school? Like a high school. That's a great question. Teacher, right. That's- you know, and so, cause I could totally see students. That's what I'm thinking. It's like a lot of these topics, like they get this stuff from the media, from their parents, from just sort Social of the media. like yeah. milieu. Right. And, and less so from like their bio teacher who's trying to teach them about like what uh, mitochondria is and, and, you know, and like <laughs> not about like the doom and gloom. Uh, like it wouldn't be, I mean, if you took a climate change class in high school in a Northeastern, you know, urban area, like maybe that class would be more focused on kind of, Hey, this is a really scary 
thing. We need to, uh, so, may, so maybe, but like how many students that come through in your class are, are have taken those classes and that's where they've learned that or is versus like the media or parents or things like that? I mean, it's a great question. I, I'm sure that they've seen a very skewed media because uh, <laughs> that's something I pay attention to. I mean, the ones, there definitely is climate in high schools and I think in most of Colorado now, uh, certainly in kind of the bluer parts. Uh, that's cool. I mean, on top of that, the ones who are taking my third year class in environmental studies who haven't seen that also haven't seen it in their first and second year classes, right? Which is kind yeah. of on our on our, our uh, profession. So yeah, I take. I guess the short answer is I don't know, but I, t- I take your point that it that it, it's 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 probably a much more complicated thing. Okay, before we wrap up, I wanna I wanna ask you one short line of questioning, and that is one of the things that I think is fascinating about the topic of political bias and, you know, political discrimination to the extent that it exists, you know, against conservatives is there are actually quite a lot of parallels to talking about other types of diversity and other types of discrimination, except that you tend to have people sort of switching sides, right? Now, one thing that I'll note off the bat, which I'm sure you'll call me on if I don't, is that an important difference between those two contexts is the, you know, the historical injustice piece, right? The, you know, we didn't have uh, Jim Crow with conservatives and liberals. We didn't have slavery with conservatives and liberals. So, so when you're talking about the justice justifications for things like affirmative action or watching out for discrimination, et cetera, clearly those cases are different. However, partly I think because of the jurisprudence on this, at least publicly, what we're more often talking about in both cases is the strength of the scientific enterprise, Right. And so, you know, conservators are saying if conservatives are so severely underrepresented, then we're missing really important questions and we're missing really important perspectives. And we're, and, and, and we're not able to relate to, you know, conservative students who are, you know, underrepresented um, in, in, in higher ed. And people say the same things, right, about women in, in, in male dominated professions, um, you know, or about minorities um, in, in kind of white, white dominated fields, uh, which, you know, is, is unfortunately still most fields. So I guess the, you know, I'm not going to ask you to kind of comment on that in general, but but let but let's let's dig into your to your results, right? Right. If we found, it seems like your results imply that we may not need to be as worried as we think about political skew in the demographics of professors. Which, for the record, I think there's pretty good evidence that it's. Uh, driven both partly by discrimination and also partly driven by choices, you know, big trade, big five trade openness correlating with liberalism and wanting to be an academic. You know, suppose that somebody did a study exactly like yours and replace uh, liberal and conservative with white and non-white or male and female and found the exact same answer that you found. What, if anything, would be the implications of that for how we should think about diversity and sort of to what extent lack of ethnic or gender diversity is is an issue? And maybe pick ethnic because I believe actually women are overrepresented in your field. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, true. like, 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 uh, as somebody who's concerned about, say, ethnic diversity in social psychology, how would that finding uh, affect your perception of that problem? And then. And then how would you translate whatever your answer to that question is to how conservatives should think about, you know, how your findings relate to the problem they care about? Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the historical piece, like you said, is, is, a, is a very important one. And I think the, the idea that like, you know, what do we want from a society? What are kind of our values comes in a lot, I think, in part from that kind of historical piece of like who has been excluded from these spaces um, even, even, even though my field, for example, is, is, uh, heavily dominated by, by women. If you look at like senior faculty, if you look at like deans or presidents of universities, right? Like the, the higher CEO, whatever d- industry or discipline you pick, the higher up you go, the, the more homogenous it gets. And it's just, it's usually just like men, usually just you know, white men. So I think the historical piece, like you said, that you, that you preempt, preempted is, is super important because the i think the values that people have on on kind of these affirmative action type policies or or related in academia for example stem stem from that um and then in terms of like what does that mean uh you know like what what would be best for the scientific enterprise in terms of creative ideas and uh inclusion of of 
of people. I think it's important to include lots of different ideas and have different viewpoint diversity. I think that, um, I think sometimes people like get caught up, right? Like, you know, if I were to say viewpoint diversity in one crowd, I could imagine some people being like, oh, that's conservative coded for he wants right. like, an alt-right person. And it's like, I don't actually think that's what we're talking about, right? Um, so I think I think it is important to have people who have different theories and different ideas. Um, and this goes back to, I think, our original question of like, where do you draw this, like, these lines, right? Of like, what questions feel, fall within this like range of like, let's think about like the scientific interesting questions and like we should have people who think about those in different ways and we should like try and all do rigorous science so that we like actually know what's going on and get good data for it um so i think it's a complicated question because again it's like uh it's something where i feel like the idea of like creating you know if you were to say you're trying to kind of call out this not hypocrisy, but this sort of like asymmetry where you would say, Hey, look, you know, we could, we have these like DEI type positions that people are hiring for sometimes more coded, sometimes less coded. And, and like, you know, conservatives are, are underrepresented. You know, why don't we have like specific conservative positions? Like we have to devote, you know, 30% of our department to be, or 50% of our department to be conservative. Why don't we have that? Right. Um, and, I think this goes to the idea that like, it, like, and, and actually like you acknowledge, like, no, I don't think anyone expects everything to be like totally equal, right? Total like 50, 50, right? Like I, there's going to be, it's within bias, I think is not when things are like anecdotally off or margins of this and that it's like systematically skewed. Right. So uh, like the idea of like, if you looked at, you know, the C-suite or university presidents or uh, tenured faculty, right. In academia, it would be like lop, very, very lopsided. And there are mathematical complexities so. there actually that are interesting. So just, just a really quick s- sidebar. You know, I, I think the great, the great, the best bellwether for trying to understand what null hypotheses should be is sports, where it's really easy to measure merit, right? Or other kinds of things like, you know, chess, right? Um, yeah. And what you do tend to find, which actually, if you dig into the statistical mechanics, is totally what you would expect to find, is the more rarefied the sample is, the more your null expectation would be actually a large skew in the demographics in one direction or another, right? Yeah. Um, so for example, I think it's the case that uh, 498 of the all-time fastest 500-meter sprint times are from men with West African ancestry. I have no idea why that is, right? But it's I'm, I'm sure it's not that the clocks are biased against white people, right? Right, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, or, you know, or... or, or, or um, you know, I, I think uh, Jewish people are something like half of the world chess champions through history and 0.2% of the global population, right? So, so when you do get to rarefied samples, and this is actually one reason why I personally think, like, let's just not, we, we don't, we should pay, we pay, I think, more attention than we should to, like, the C-suite and the president and not enough attention to, like, the entry level, right? Uh, you know, yeah. p- partly for that reason. But a- anyway, sorry, you, you, you were saying. Well, yeah, so and I, and I was saying that I think that, uh, that the um, the historical piece for me is is like a I think just like a very important consideration because it's like you said like conservatives have not faced the same Jim Crow slavery type of right. uh, exclusionary practices from society and in this case academia that that other folks have so um, I think like uh, so I guess I try and hold both I, I like both recognize that these are not it's it's is an apples to oranges comparison in a way. I recognize the like veiled hypocrisy in, in the principles of it. And I also uh, think it's important to like have good diverse viewpoints um, on, on in, at universities. But so I, you know, I, I think people, sh- I think people should try and be mindful. I think we need to develop like systems to, to keep our biases in check, to try and think rigorously about like the ideas that people are studying that we think will be, like you said, supportive for other people who want these ideas to come through um, and to, uh, yeah, ensure that we we are like pursuing a productive scientific enterprise through multiple different angles of that, you know. And so I, I, I think I try and hold all of those things at the same time, which is not easy because it's, they sometimes, you know, come in conflict with each other. Yeah. And so maybe two tiny follow-ups and then we should, we should wrap up. Sure. The first is, 
So if I'm hearing you right, it sounds like you're saying the diversity case for a drawing from a broad pool is strong in both cases. There's a justice case in one, you know, in the case of minorities, particularly African-Americans, and not in the case of conservatives. And so for that reason, the case for affirmative action is stronger for minorities than for conservatives. Am, am I characterizing that correct? Try yeah, I think that's right. Um, okay. So then my second question is, what, if anything, should we do about discrimination against conservatives? Which, again, I believe there's strong evidence that that exists, uh, and including from that social psychology paper that you mentioned by uh, uh, Joe Duarte. You know, so should that be, so for example, at, at CU Boulder, uh, I think to our credit, we have a policy that says that it includes political affiliation and political philosophy in the protected categories in our discrimination policy. Um, right. There isn't in practice, you know, affirmative action. I mean, there's this one sabbatical position, right, which in, in right. a sense is, a, is, a, is conservative affirmative action. But, you know, you're never, if, if, you, if you put in a proposal for a conservative as your, you know, DEI higher, right. You'd be dead on arrival. <laughs> uh, yeah. so, so, so what do you think the policy should be and kind of, and, and, and kind of how should it be policed? Cause, cause some people I think would say, like, let me give you two, two examples that illustrate what I mean by that. So like in the case of, you know, two identical academics and one just has on his CV that he worked for John McCain and the other one has in the CV that he works for Obama, I think most people would agree that you shouldn't discriminate against the person who worked for McCain, right? If they're kind of otherwise identical. And if, you, and if, and if there was some way to measure that, then that would be wrong. And, and, and see you, you know, that would certainly be punishable, at least in theory. Um, the, but I think, I, think where the, I think where the pushback might come from some liberals is, you know, when does a we don't discriminate against conservatives policy become a, you know, we have to let climate deniers be on our geoscience faculty policy? Right. Personally, I think it's a little bit of a Mott and Bailey, but kind of what would be your answer to that? And kind of where, where would you draw the line? Yeah, I think that um, I think part of this is like there's so many domains in science and academia where this I don't want to call it gatekeeping, but where these junctures occur, right? Whether you're at a conference and you're submitting an abstract to give a talk or a poster, whether you're submitting a paper to get published in a journal, whether you're applying to a job for a postdoc or for a faculty position, right? There's so many of these junctures where there's a review process that's happening and a selection process. And the question is, is that selection process biased? How do we keep it unbiased? And and I think the there is no you know clearly no silver bullet. If I had the answer, it would have already been solved because someone else smarter would have thought of it. But I think that the idea of I think it's it's important to have that um, listed on your on the policy documents. I think it's important to you know ensure that you have diverse reviewers and thinking about like the camp you know the camps that people fall into. I think about this even along like theoretical lines, right? Like totally when you're picking picking reviewers, like should you be picking reviewers who kind of all fall in this theoretical camp or should you try and get a diverse, you know, and it's the same dimension. It's a different dimension, 100%. but the same concept of like, let's get, you know, different theoretical takes on this, never mind just like politics. But, um, so I think that's important whether you're, you know, reviewing conference papers or abstracts or you know, journals or hiring decisions. And in terms of policing that, I think a lot of it is probably just like norm shifting. I don't think it's easy to police. I mean, when I think about like departments, I don't know how, how it works in, in econ or in ecology, but like, uh, you know, you have this review search committee of, you know, four faculty members and one person leads the search and then they're trying to like figure it out with like the rest of the department, but there's like internal politics in the department and who, the chair and the dean. And sure. Yeah. There's like, it's right. And so how do you police the, what's the process for that? review um you know i think we have to fall back on the things we know about like um, trying to blind ourselves from from some of the relevant information that we might want to bias ourselves but but you also at the same time have to know that as we do that that information isn't always something that is invisible right like if we're talking about like the theoretical ideas like you're going to read someone's work and know kind of which camp they're from yeah so i think that i think what i was going to say around the norm setting piece was just that like i think that people fear the extremes, right? And, sure, and even though yeah. you were you you were sort of like j joking that like you know of course this is like this is not really what we mean, but I think that's that's actually I think 
important because I think a lot of people fear that. They fear like totally. what you mean is that you're going to let in uh, people who think the earth is flat and we should include people who are conspiracy theorists because it's a diversity of ideas. And it's like, well, no, that's a terrible idea. Uh, yeah. So then, you know, I think being very like having these kinds of conversations, being transparent about like, what are we actually talking about? Uh, if you're talking about um, studying, you know, different market structures or like whether our climate estimates have been like overstated in terms of the, how quickly we'll reach, you know, a certain global rise in, in temperatures and, and then like the, those effects, like, yeah, like let's, let's talk about how, how good or not good those estimates are and, and uh, you know, in, in your field or, or, and whatnot. So I think, um, having these conversations, norm setting within your own field of like, what do we, what is the range of things we're talking about? And then kind of drawing, drawing those lines. And then you're asking me like, where's the line get drawn? I mean, it depends on the field, but like, you know, if, if someone, you know, I can even think of a colleague I have who, who I know is, is uh, conservative and, and whose research is, is, you know, fairly conservative, not coded, but you know, would, would be rated that way, I suppose. Um, and that's fine. I don't know. Like it's the, to me within reasonable realm of like something they're interested in studying, you know, they always say research is me search. And so fine, but like, right. I don't, I don't want a flat earther in, in the environmental studies department or like anywhere in academia. Um, and yeah, I think we'd have to like maybe go through and like list out the topics that seem like uh, pretty either scientifically uh, void from, you know, the discussion because it's like, just, it's, you know, it's implausible or it's, uh, not, not something that societally we, we value and, and think about like where to draw that line. Yeah. It's, it's tricky to think about all the various different disciplines and where to draw that line. But, um, yeah. So would it be fair to say as maybe a, a final thought that, that as long as we have norms of curiosity and rigor, and therefore we're interested, you know, our first, our first thought is when we see something that is contrasting with our priors, like, Oh, that's interesting. Right. But then we chase whatever, everything down uh, rigorously. My guess would be that, and I think this is kind of what you're getting, maybe what you're getting at too, is that that actually solves doesn't, I don't think it solves the whole problem, but it solves a larger fraction of the problem that people think. And I think your study is one data point in support of that. And also, as you alluded to, you know, my experience, which I have to say has been overwhelmingly positive of publishing, you know, uh, cold water type research about climate scenarios, right, is also, I think, a data point on that, that, you know, mm -hmm. there were a couple of people who, who, who didn't like it, but the, the vast majority of people have responded with curiosity and rigor and, uh, and, yeah. and, and, and have welcomed it. Right. Would, would you I, agree with I, that? Yeah, I would definitely share that sentiment. I think curiosity and rigor is a very important tenet to hold going forward. Great. Well, that's a good positive note to end on. Dave Renero, uh, thanks so much for this fascinating and far-reaching conversation, and we'll see you soon. Thanks so much for having me. It's great being here. The Free Mind Podcast is produced by the Benson Center for the Study of Western Civilization at the University of Colorado Boulder. You can email us feedback at freemind at colorado.edu or visit us online at colorado.edu slash center slash Benson. You can also find us on social media. Our Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube accounts are all at Benson Center. Our Instagram is at the Benson Center. And the Facebook is at Bruce D. Benson Center. <laughs>